The 2003 NBA draft class is one of the most stacked that we have ever seen. It might remind you of the 1996 draft class that featured players like Kobe Bryant, Allen Iverson, Ray Allen, Steve Nash, and the 1984 draft class that featured players such as Michael Jordan, Hakeem Olajuwon, Charles Barkley, and John Stockton. But this draft class in 2003 featured nine all-stars and at least four players that are likely to find their way into the Hall of Fame at some point. We're going to start it off today by talking about one of those players, one of the best even today as he closes in on the age of 39. Now, leading up to the NBA draft, LeBron James was already declared as the chosen one of the NBA, and scouts were head over heels with nearly every facet of his game. He had elite passing vision, especially for a wing player. Along with this, he was a physical specimen, allowing him to jump out of the gym and a dangerous shot blocker. There were some that thought he might crack under the immense amount of pressure that was placed on him coming right out of high school, and it was clear that his jump shot needed a little bit of work for him to have a truly complete game. Nonetheless, he was drafted to his hometown team, the Cleveland Cavaliers, with the first overall pick, and James was quick to silence all the doubters and averaged an elite 20.9 points, 5.5 rebounds, and 5.9 assists per game his rookie season, earning him the Rookie of the Year award. An important highlight of his first stint in Cleveland would come in the 2007 playoff run in which he would put the entire franchise on his back. In Game 5 of the Eastern Conference Finals, he would set his then career high in playoff points with a 48-point outburst against one of the best defensive teams in the league at the time, the Detroit Pistons. Along with this, he would come up huge in the clutch, scoring Cleveland's final 25 points and 29 of their last 30 points. James left everyone in awe that night, including his opponents, and after the game, Chauncey Billups was quoted as saying, We threw everything we had at him. We just couldn't stop him. It's frustrating. He put on an unbelievable display out there. It's probably the best I have seen against us ever in the playoffs. However, in the NBA Finals, they would run into a brutal San Antonio Spurs team. Cleveland lacked the depth that the Spurs possessed at the time, and because of this, San Antonio was able to throw constant double teams at LeBron, leading to the Cavs being swept in that series. Even with James having a rough series in that one, it was very clear that he was something special and just might live up to the expectations of being an all-time great. Following Game 4 of the series, Tim Duncan told him, This is going to be your league in a little while, but I appreciate you giving us this year. This was extremely high praise for any player to receive, let alone one that was 22 years old at the time. James would be unable to lead the Cavs back to the finals in his first stint with the team, partially due to the front office being unable to put a competent roster around him. This would lead to one of the most controversial moves in NBA history that would put the player empowerment movement into motion. He held an hour-long announcement special that would be aired on ESPN that ended in an infamous quote. In this fall, this is very tough. In this fall, I'm going to take my talents to South Beach and join the Miami Heat. He would go on to say, like I said before, I feel like it's going to give me the best opportunity to win and to win for multiple years. And not only just win in the regular season or just to win five games in a row or three games in a row, I want to be able to win championships. He would call a shot as the Heat would go on to win two titles in his next four years with the team. However, it would be a tough road to get there. In his first season with the Heat, it seemed like no team was going to stop him. However, in the finals, they would be stunned by the Dallas Mavericks and lose in six games. James had a complete collapse in this series, and it still stands as the largest stain on his legacy. When talking about this time, James was quoted as saying, My first year in Miami, I was down there and I was like, I was literally like, I wanted to prove everybody wrong. And I like literally lost myself in the moment. I lost myself. And I got all the way to the championship that year and lost. And the reason I know afterward, I was like, we lost because I wasn't even there. It was clear that there were still some essential improvements that James needed to make to his game. And he took the summer heading into the 2011 to 12 season to work closely with Hakeem Olajuwon to further round out his post game. In those next NBA Finals, James and the Heat would go on to take down the Oklahoma City Thunder in only five games. While this was a very young and inexperienced team at the time, it still featured three future MVPs in Kevin Durant, Russell Westbrook, and James Harden. After finally winning his first championship, James was quoted as saying, It means everything. I made a difficult decision to leave Cleveland but I understood what my future was about. I understood that coming to Miami and being a part of this organization and being able to put together this team, I knew we had a bright future. This was a dream come true for me. I've been through a lot the last two years, but this is definitely the way that it pays off. Losing in the finals last year put me back in place. It humbled me a lot. I was able to go back to the basics. A lot of people had a lot to do with it. But at the end of the day, I just looked myself in the mirror and said, you need to be better. 
both on and off the floor. I'm happy I was able to put myself and our team in a position to win this. Following season, James was able to avenge his loss to Tim Duncan and the Spurs from 2007. Despite the team featuring a ton of talent in Tony Parker, Manu Ginobili, Tim Duncan, and Kawhi Leonard, James and the Heat were able to win in a very tough seven-game series. However, they would not be as lucky the following year. Despite Miami's best efforts, the Spurs were playing at an unbelievable level and were able to take this series in only five games. At this point, Wade and Bosch were beginning to regress due to some injuries here and there, and James got out while the getting was good and made his return to Cleveland. In the speech announcing his decision, he was quoted as saying, I feel my calling here goes above basketball. I have a responsibility to lead in more ways than one, and I take that very seriously. My presence can make a difference in Miami, but I think it can mean more where I'm from. I want kids in Northeast Ohio, like the hundreds of Akron third graders I sponsor through my foundation, to realize that there's no better place to grow up. Maybe some of them will come home after college and start a family or open a business. That would make me smile. Our community, which has struggled so much, needs all the talent it can get. Northeast Ohio, nothing is given. Everything is earned. You work for what you have. I'm ready to accept the challenge. I'm coming home. Bron and the Cavs would take on the Golden State Warriors in the NBA Finals for the entirety of his four-year return to the team, and in 2015, he put on a masterful performance. However, with both Kyrie Irving and Kevin Love out with injuries, there was only so much that he could do with the entire team on his back. James would be able to extend the series to six games. However, it was clear that alone, he was not going to be able to take down Golden State. In the following season, it appeared that the Warriors would once again get the best of Cleveland, but James would lead them to a historic 3-1 comeback, the first time that this has ever occurred in NBA Finals history. Arguably, the most notable play of James's career would occur in Game 7 of this series when James sprinted full court and chased down an Andre Iguodala layup attempt. After the historic Game 7 win, James was quoted as saying, I gave everything that I have. I put my heart and my blood and my sweat and my tears in this game against all odds. I don't know why we want to take the hardest road. I don't know why the man above gave me the hardest road, but there's nothing the man above going to put new situations that you can't handle. And I just kept the same positive attitude. Like instead of saying, why me? I was saying, this is what he wanted me to do. Cleveland, this is for you. Unfortunately, this would be the only finals win that James picked up in his second stint in Cleveland. In the following season, the Warriors added Kevin Durant to the roster, putting together arguably the most talented team ever assembled in NBA history. In the 2017 NBA Finals, James and the Cavs would fall in five games, and after that season, Kyrie Irving would request a trade and was sent to the Boston Celtics for Isaiah Thomas, Jay Crowder, Antti Zizek, a first round pick, and a second round pick. Along with this, the Cavs would sign Hall of Fame caliber veterans like Dwayne Wade and Derrick Rose. It was thought that this star power would be enough to match the Warriors' rotation. However, they would not mesh together well on the court at all, and most of the team was traded at the deadline. The Cavs were swept in the 2018 Finals, and in the offseason, James would sign with the Los Angeles Lakers. Thus far during his time with the Lakers, James's stint has been riddled with injuries here and there, but that's expected as he continues to age. Despite this, when he's on the court, he remains as one of the top talents in the entire league, despite turning 39 years old this season. While the team added Anthony Davis to the roster, he has also struggled here and there through his time in LA with injuries of his own. In their first season together though, the duo would take down the Miami Heat in the 2020 NBA Finals. However, this would be the only time that James and the Lakers have made it at the Western Conference in his five full seasons with the team. The most notable moment from James's time in Los Angeles so far came last season when he broke Kareem Abdul-Jabbar's record for the most career points in NBA history. Despite never being known as a pure scorer, I mean, LeBron loves to distribute the ball here and there, this record is truly a testament to the once-in-a-lifetime longevity that he's displayed. So far, he's won the 2003-2004 Rookie of the Year Award, made 19 All-Star appearances, 19 All-NBA selections, 6 All-Defensive selections, 1 scoring title, 1 assist title, 4 MVP awards, 4 NBA titles, 4 Finals MVPs, and made an appearance on the NBA 75th Anniversary Team. Up to this point in time, LeBron is still with the Lakers trying to lead them to yet another playoff appearance and he is the only player on this list that we're talking about today that is still actively playing. Up next we have a player who would go down as one of the biggest busts in NBA history in a lot of people's books despite the longevity of his career. Coming into the draft scouts were very high on Darko Milicic. He was thought of as a great inside scorer that could space the floor well and was an absolute nightmare for opposing players on the defensive end. There were some worries about his consistency for 
sure. While he showed a lot of potential, he showed it for just short stretches of time. Despite this, the championship caliber Detroit Pistons took him with the second overall pick in this draft. Had they selected one of the next three players we're going to cover here, there's a strong chance that they could have had a dynasty throughout the early 2000s. Now, it became clear early on that Darko was not going to amount to much in the NBA. He struggled to find minutes on the Pistons and was traded midway through his third season with the team. The deal sent Milicic and Carlos Arroyo to the Orlando Magic for Kelvin Cato and a first round pick. After failing to receive a contract extension with the Magic, he signed a three year deal with the Memphis Grizzlies was miserable in Memphis and this was arguably the lowest point of his entire career. He was traded midway through the final year of his contract, this time to the New York Knicks for Quinton Richardson and cash considerations. After playing in only 8 games, he strongly considered leaving the NBA and beginning a career overseas, however he stuck it out with the NBA and made his way to the Minnesota Timberwolves where he actually had the best stretch of his career. His second season with the team, he averaged a career high of 8.8 .8 points per game along with 5.2 rebounds and 2.0 blocks. After his three-year stint with the Timberwolves was over, he would wrap up his career with the Boston Celtics where he played in one game only. Nowadays, he has turned into a farmer and just enjoys tending to his crops. Quite the switch up from playing basketball. Selected third overall, we have a future Hall of Famer and one of the best scorers of this generation. Carmelo Anthony entered the 2003 draft coming off of an NCAA title at Syracuse where he would prove himself as one of if not the most talented scorers in the entire class. Scouts viewed him as a three level scorer that could thrive in isolation and along with this, his elite athleticism made him a threat to anybody trying to stop him at the rim. However, there were some concerns about his ability and effort on the defensive end of the ball. Despite this, the Denver Nuggets did not hesitate for a second to pick him with the third overall selection. He would go on to have a great rookie season, and some would still argue to this day that he deserved the Rookie of the Year award over LeBron James. Melo averaged 21.0 points and 6.1 rebounds per game while leading the Nuggets to a playoff berth. While they would follow the Minnesota Timberwolves in five games, it would still be a very impressive feat to have such a strong single season turnaround. Anthony's best season with the Nuggets regular season stats wise would come in the 2006 to 2007 season where he would average 28.9 points, 6.0 rebounds, and 3.8 assists per game. In the postseason of the 2008 to 2009 season, Anthony would lead the Nuggets to the Western Conference Finals after taking down both the New Orleans Hornets and the Dallas Mavericks in five games. Despite running into a very talented Los Angeles Lakers team in the Western Conference Finals, they would still push the series to six games, but after another playoff defeat in the first round of the following season, Anthony was ready for a new environment in a bigger market. In the middle of the 2010-11 season, the Nuggets would trade him to the New York Knicks in a blockbuster three-team deal. The deal was a bit complicated, but just to keep it simple, we're only going to cover who the Nuggets and the Knicks received. The Nuggets would send Anthony, Chauncey Billups, Sheldon Williams, Anthony Carter, Ronaldo Balkman, and a first round draft pick to the Knicks and in return they received Wilson Chandler, Raymond Felton, Danilo Gallinari, Timothy Mozgov, two second round draft picks, two first round draft picks, and cash. Melo would continue to light up the league and even led the league in scoring in the 2012-13 season with 28.7 points per game. However, it would not lead to much success in the postseason, winning only one series in his entire time with the Knicks. After seven years with the team, Phil Jackson would finally decide to pull the plug on the experiment and trade one of the biggest stars in Knicks history. The deal sent Anthony to the Oklahoma City Thunder for Enos Cantor, Doug McDermott, and a second round draft pick. Many thought this would launch the Thunder into being real contenders in the Western Conference with three elite scorers with Anthony, Russell Westbrook, and Paul George. Anthony would remain with the Thunder for only one season though and things really didn't work out as expected, resulting in another first round exit in the postseason. In the offseason, Melo would be traded to the Atlanta Hawks in a three-team deal. The trade ended up with Melo, Justin Anderson, and a first round draft pick on the Hawks and Timothy Luwawu Cabarro and Dennis Schroeder on the Thunder. He would then have his contract bought out by the Hawks and sign with the Houston Rockets to join Chris Paul and James Harden but this would be a very short-lived stint in Houston. Around this time, Anthony was being labeled as a selfish ball hog that really destroyed any team's chances of being a true contender. After Melo failed to get signed through the remainder of the 2018-19 season, it appeared that he may be forced into an early retirement, but Damian Lillard would strongly encourage the Portland Trailblazers front office to give him one more chance. This would end up being a career-reviving move for Melo, who thrived on the Trailblazers roster. 
While he would serve as the team's full-time starting power forward in the 2019-20 season, he would fully embrace a bench role in his final season with the team. The last season of his Hall of Fame caliber career would come as a member of the Los Angeles Lakers. Many thought this would be a great chance for him to end his career with a championship, however, the Lakers would greatly struggle with injuries and the addition of Russell Westbrook to the roster didn't go to plan either, causing them to miss the playoffs. Despite this, Anthony still had a strong season off the bench for the team, but at the age of 37, he decided to call it a career. Over his 19 years in the league, Anthony was named to the All-Star Game 10 times, the All-NBA team 6 times, won one scoring title, and made the NBA 75th anniversary team. While he would end his career without an appearance in the NBA Finals, and some still think that he was too focused on individual stats than team success, his talent as a scorer is just undeniable. When discussing the greatest scorer in NBA history, Gilbert Arenas was quoted as saying, You would go mellow because he had 4-level, 5-level scoring. There's posting up an ISO player. Mellow posted up and he was an ISO player. When it comes down to who is the most complete scorer, I'm going to say Mellow. And there is no doubt that Mello is going to be a Hall of Famer one day in the future. Up next, we have one of the most unselfish superstars in recent NBA history at the fourth pick. Chris Bosh entered the draft coming off of an all-conference season at Georgia Tech. Scouts were in love with his versatility. He was able to space the floor with respectable mid-range jumper and was a dominant interior defender. His athleticism and deep basketball IQ made him able to play either the power forward or the center position, but there were some doubts on if he was going to be able to continue to play center in the NBA with much stronger competition. Toronto Raptors picked him up with the fourth overall pick and Bosch proved himself as more than capable of playing that center position at the NBA level, putting together a very respectable 11.5 points, 7.4 rebounds, and 1.4 blocks per game. He would continue to improve every season of his seven-year stint in Toronto, and he would serve as an incredible option besides Vince Carter through his first two years in the league. However, they would struggle to turn their great individual performances into overall team success. This mainly came because of the lack of depth on the roster, a trend that would continue throughout Bosch's entire tenure with the team. With Carter no longer on the roster, Bosch now ran the show and would make the All-Star game each following season that he played with the team. His best year with the Raptors would come in his final year with the team where he averaged 24.0 points and 10.8 rebounds, both of which would go on to be career highs. In his seven years with Toronto, he would lead the team to the postseason twice, but was bounced in the first round both times. As a result of the lack of help around him, Bosch would be the first piece put in motion in the 2010 offseason to assemble the big three of him, LeBron, and Dwayne Wade. It appeared that nobody was going to be able to stop this unit. However, like we talked about, the Dallas Mavericks would go on to stun them in their first trip to the NBA Finals. Where LeBron James collapsed in that series, the same could not be said about Chris Bosch. He averaged a very respectable 18.5 points and 7.3 rebounds per game and was tasked with guarding Dirk Nowitzki for most of the time. While Dirk was still the driving force in the Mavericks ultimately winning the series, Bosch was able to limit him slightly to a 26 point per game average compared to the 28.4 points per game average that he had in the three series leading up to the finals. In the offseason, Bosch was focused on doing whatever he could to help the team win. He had already accepted a role as the team's third option on offense, something that had to be extremely difficult after being the face of the franchise in Toronto. When talking about his experience in taking on a reduced role, Bosch was quoted as saying, Yeah, it's a lot more difficult taking a step back because you're used to doing something a certain way and getting looks a certain way. And then it's like, well, no, for the benefit of the team, you have to get it here. So even if you do like the left block, the volume of the left block is going to be different. Now you have to make those moves count. So with me, it was like a chess game. I'm doing this move and thinking about the next move and trying to stay five moves ahead. You're not getting it as much. If you got one or two a game, it's a lot different. Bosch would begin becoming more and more comfortable with his outside shot, leading to better court spacing with him at the center position. These sacrifices played a huge role in the Heat winning the next two championships over the Oklahoma City Thunder and the San Antonio Spurs, but after an incredible performance from the entire Spurs roster, the Heat would lose the final series of the Big Three era. After the departure of LeBron James in the 2014 offseason, the Heat would attempt to replace him with Luol Deng, and this led to Bosch getting to play a much bigger role in the offense, averaging 21.1 points per game in the first year of the Wade and Bosch-led offense. While the aging Bosch and Wade were not able to replicate the postseason success that they saw with LeBron on the roster, they were still a tough playoff matchup for any team to go against. Sadly, in the 2016-17 season, Bosch would have his career cut to an early end due to a blood clot being discovered in his left leg. 
This came just a year after he had been hospitalized with blood clots in his lungs. With the risk of Bosch potentially dying on the court to those clots, Heat were forced to cut him from the team despite Bosch not wanting to retire just yet. When talking about this time, he said, You don't know how to take it. Life gets shortened into smaller bites. I was happy to be alive. I was happy just to have the smallest things. I felt right away that I was written off. I have the right to disagree with you. It wasn't a matter of if I'm going to play again, it's when. Unfortunately, Bosch would not be able to make a comeback from this and was forced to retire. However, he was still able to put together an incredible NBA career with 11 All-Star appearances, one All-NBA selection, two NBA titles, and was inducted into the Hall of Fame in 2021. Since retiring from the league, Bosch has learned to code, play the guitar, produce music, and wrote a book with advice for younger athletes. Up next, we have one of the greatest shooting guards that the game has ever seen, and Bosch's teammate on that big three. Dwayne Wade came to the draft coming off being named the Conference USA Player of the Year in his final year at Marquette. Scouts were extremely high on his athleticism, ability to finish around the basket, and shot blocking ability, especially for a guard. The only weak spot at the time seemed to be his outside shot. The Heat still selected him with the fifth overall pick, and he would go on to be the best player in franchise history. Wade would quickly establish himself as a franchise caliber player and almost instantly threw the Heat into a win now situation, and as a result of this, in only his second year in the league, Pat Riley and the front office made the blockbuster move of trading for Shaquille O'Neal. In their first year together, they would lead the Heat to the Eastern Conference Finals, but they would be eliminated in a hard-fought seven-game series by the Detroit Pistons. However, in the following season, the two teams would meet up again in the Eastern Conference Finals. With another year of sharing the court together and Dwayne Wade developing, the Heat would win this series in six games and take down the Dallas Mavericks in six games in the NBA Finals. Wade would end up taking home the Finals MVP award, the first and only of his career. When talking about this time with Wade, Shaq was quoted as saying, Dwayne Wade reminds me of a superhero movie. He does not know he has the power until he meets a powerful figure, and they tell him, hey, you just like me. After this season, O'Neal would continue to regress with age, and Wade would continue to play a bigger role in the Heat's offense. However, he would not be able to lead them back to the finals with this core. His best season of the pre-LeBron era would come in the 2008-9 season, where he averaged 30.2 points, 5.0 rebounds, 7.5 assists, 2.2 steals, and 1.3 blocks per game, setting career highs in points, assists, steals, and blocks per game, along with leading the league in points this season. Now, it could be argued that Wade made the biggest sacrifice out of any player of the big three on the Miami Heat. He was the most beloved player in Heat history and was treated like royalty in the city. Acquiring players like James and Bosch, not only would he have his on-court opportunities cut, but he would also have to share the spotlight as well. When talking about the sacrifices that were needed when playing as a big three, he said, we all knew the sacrifice that was going to be made. Obviously, you sit down and you talk about playing together. You think you know what's going to happen, you try to cover things in that moment, but then once you start playing together, you realize it's harder than what you thought. But we all knew we had to sacrifice. But at the end of the day, we sacrificed points, article hits, but what we gained was championships, friendships, and brotherhoods that last a lifetime. So I'm sure if we could do it all over again, we'd do it exactly the same way. Wade would be an elite second option through the four years of James being on the team and was an integral part of their two championships even though knee injuries would cause him to see a bit of regression towards the tail end of their run. The season Bosch was being deemed medically unable to return to basketball, Wade would also leave Miami, signing with his hometown Chicago Bulls. This paired him with Rajon Rondo and Jimmy Butler. While this was an incredible team on paper, locker room issues would lead to them not seeing too much success. After one year in Chicago, he would join LeBron in Cleveland in an attempt to topple the Golden State Warriors. However, Wade would request to be traded back to Miami at the trade deadline once it became clear he was not the best fit in this offensive scheme. He spent the final two years of his career in Miami, earning an incredible send-off tour in the 2018-19 season. Wade called the career after 16 years in the league, making 13 All-Star teams, 8 All-NBA teams, 3 All-Defensive teams, winning 3 NBA titles, one finals MVP, made the NBA 75th anniversary team, and was inducted into the Hall of Fame in 2023. Since retiring, Wade has been trying to focus more on his mental health and is a minority owner in the Utah Jazz. The next player up at pick number six, many forgot was a one-time All-Star. Chris Kamen entered the draft coming off being named the Conference Player of the Year and Defensive Player of the Year in his final season at Central Michigan. 
Scouts looked at him as a traditional big man for the time, a solid scorer around the basket, a good rebounder, and a rim protector. There were not too many doubts about his game, and teams felt as if they knew exactly what they're going to get with him. The Los Angeles Clippers picked him with the 6th overall pick, and he quickly found a spot for himself in the rotation. Kamen would serve as the team's starting center for the entirety of his 8-year run with the team. His best season would come where he averaged 18.5 points, 9.3 rebounds, and 1.2 blocks per game. This would earn him a spot on the All-Star team, the first and only of his career. But towards the tail end of his run with the Clippers, injuries would begin to take a toll on him and he would jump in and out of the starting lineup. In the 2011-12 season, he was traded to the New Orleans Hornets in a deal that sent Kamen, Al Farouk Aminu, Eric Gordon, and a first round pick to the Hornets and in return, they got Chris Paul and a second round pick. Kamen would finish the year out with the Hornets before signing a one-year deal with the Dallas Mavericks. In the following offseason, he signed on for a single season with the Los Angeles Lakers. He then spent the final two years of his career as a member of the Portland Trailblazers. While he only played in 16 games in the 2015-16 season, he would still be serviceable when he was called onto the floor and served as a great mentor for the team's young players. After getting married, Kamen moved to rural Michigan and bought a farm where he currently lives with his wife and kids. Up next, we have a player who would go on to be a very serviceable guard, spending most of his career bouncing in and out of the starting lineup for each team that he played for. Kirk Heinrich entered the NBA draft coming off the third all-conference selection at Kansas. Scouts looked at him as a very NBA-ready player who had a high basketball IQ and elite three-pointer, a pest as a perimeter defender, and was a great passer. There were, however, some concerns about whether he had the physique to be truly effective in the league, especially after spending four years in college. Chicago Bulls picked him up with the seventh overall pick. It did not take him long to break into the starting lineup and adjust extremely well to the league. His best season with the Bulls would come in the 2006 to 2007 season where he averaged 16.6 points, 6.3 assists, and 1.3 steals per game, earning him a spot on the all-defensive team. After his seventh season in Chicago, Heinrich would be a part of a deal that sent him, Kevin Serafin, and Cash to the Washington Wizards for Vladimir Viraminko. At the deadline, Heinrich would be on the move again, being dealt to the Atlanta Hawks along with Hilton Armstrong for Mike Bibby, Jordan Crawford, Maury Sevens, and a first round pick. After two years in Atlanta, Heinrich would make a return to Chicago, signing with the team in free agency. After another full four seasons with the Bulls, Heinrich would once again be traded to Atlanta in a three-team deal. He played out the final 11 games of his career with the team before retiring in the 2015-16 season. Overall, Heinrich had a very solid career averaging 10.9 points per game and 4.8 assists over the course of his 13 years in the league. After retiring from the NBA, Heinrich and his family moved to South Dakota where he would serve as the lead academy specialist at Sanford Power Basketball Academy. The next player drafted showed a fair amount of potential, however, their career would be hampered by injuries. TJ Ford came into the draft after two consecutive all-conference seasons at Texas. Scouts saw him as a player that was incredibly shifty around the basket, a great facilitator, and a pesky perimeter defender. However, with him standing at only 6 foot and weighing around 165 pounds, they were not too sure if he could keep up with the physicality at the NBA level. Despite these concerns, the Milwaukee Bucks still selected him with the 8th overall pick. He started for the entirety of his rookie season and played a very traditional point guard role. Unfortunately, he struggled to score very efficiently, however, he was still a great passer and outside defender. His rookie season would be cut short due to a rough fall that would cause him to suffer a contusion of his spinal cord. This is an injury that has the potential to end a player's career and force Ford to miss the entire following year. Fortunately, he was able to return to action in the 2005-2006 season and reclaimed his role as the starting point guard. After a very strong campaign in his first year back from the injury, he was traded along with Cash to the Toronto Raptors for Charlie Villanueva. Ford would continue to be a quality starting point guard in his first year in Toronto, however, he would see a diminished role in his second season with the team. After two years with the Raptors, Ford, Rasho Nesterovich, Maceo Baston, and Roy Hibbert would be traded to the Indiana Pacers for Jermaine O'Neal and Nathan Jawai. He would bounce in and out of the starting lineup early on in Indiana before struggling to see the floor in his final season with the team. Ford spent the final year of his career with the San Antonio Spurs after signing with the team in free agency. He played in 14 games in the 2011-12 season before retiring in the offseason. After retiring, Ford set his sights on the TJ Ford Basketball Academy, which is a youth basketball program for boys and girls in the Houston area. Up next, we have a player who would struggle to adjust their game to the NBA level. Mike Sweetney declared for the draft after two all-conference seasons in his final two years at Georgetown. Scouts were very high on his post-game on both sides of the ball, however, 
they were a bit unsure how he would make it work as a 6'8 center at the NBA level. New York Knicks drafted him with the ninth overall pick, however, things got off to a concerning start to say the least. He struggled to see the floor in his rookie season, but he would jump in and out of the starting lineup the following season. This would be the strongest season of his career where he averaged 8.4 points and 5.4 rebounds. In the offseason, he was traded to the Chicago Bulls along with Tim Thomas, Jermaine Jackson, two first round picks and two second round picks for Eddie Curry, Antonio Davis, and a first round pick. He would have similar numbers in his first year in Chicago, however, weight issues would begin to take a major toll on Sweetney's career. His final year in the league would come in the 2006-2007 season where he played in 48 games but failed to crack the starting lineup in any of them. After retiring, Sweetney has become a mental health advocate and is the assistant coach of the Shiva University men's basketball team and is the head coach of a girls varsity basketball team. Rounding off the top 10 picks of this draft class is another player who struggled to find his place in the NBA and was out of the league relatively early on. Jarvis Hayes entered the draft coming off two all-conference seasons at Georgia. Scouts were very high on his scoring ability, and he was thought of as a very well-rounded player. However, there were some concerns that he was a bit too selfish on the offensive end. The Washington Wizards selected him with the 10th overall pick, and he got off to a solid start to his career, spending four years in Washington. His best year with the team would come in the 2004-2005 season, where he averaged 10.2 points and 4.2 rebounds, both of which were career highs. Third year in the league would be hampered by injuries, allowing him to only play in 21 games, and then in the following season, he would primarily come off the bench. In the 2007 offseason, he signed a one-year deal with the Detroit Pistons. He served as a scoring spark off the bench once again and filled the role very well. Despite this, he would sign with the New Jersey Nets the following offseason to serve as the team's sixth man. He played a bench role in his final few years in the league, and after the 2009-2010 season, he would retire from basketball. Hayes now serves as an assistant coach to the Georgia State men's basketball team. Now, if you guys enjoyed this video, all I ask of you, drop a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, and go check out some of my other videos. We will be coming at you with the 2004 draft class here very shortly.